So, um, this is uh, our play Desire Under the Elms by Eugene O'Neill and uh, the play was published in 1924 and uh, it is strictly speaking it falls under the category of naturalism. Now, tell me which other work have you done recently that conforms to this theory of naturalism? Recently, recently an American tragedy. How does Miss Julie come? I said no, I said recent work that we have done and when was that published? It was published in 1925. Okay, and now both of these are nat highly naturalistic works. And uh, when you, uh, when we, I was telling you about the movie which was based on an American tragedy, it is called A Place in the Sun. Okay, now what does a place in the sun mean? What is having a place in the sun mean? It is an idiomatic term, what does it mean? You make your own place in the sun or you gain a place in the sun. You have your own standing. So, that is what the play that is what the movie is about and that is what the novel is all about. Okay? Now, look at the similarity a place in the sun, desire under the elms and then American tragedy, naturalism natural and American tragedy is also a uh, story of give me some of the words that I talked about American dream, something else what is the hero like driven by or and passion, did someone say desire did and no one said ambition. Okay. So, the ambition is at the heart, we were talking about the themes, there is passion, desire, ambition and those are the defining themes of an American tragedy and uh, uncannily although you know one is a drama, one is a novel, but then you will find several features overlapping of these. So, it is a good uh, exercise to compare the two, the two texts, although they belong to different genres, okay, but they subscribe to the same theory of naturalism. Now, who can <laughs> revise naturalism with me? How, what, how is nature pro, uh, represented in naturalism? In a raw, hmm? raw, like it shows naturalism, yeah. R-A-W, so nature is raw and earthy. We were also talking about you know when uh, um, we came to a point when Clive, uh, Clyde Griffith, okay, Clyde Griffith takes uh, this girl. So, he is taking her uh, uh, for this boat ride and uh, there is, yes. So, what is the nature like? Nature Very romantic? Hmm. Nature reflects the conflict within. Okay. So, nature is hostile. Okay. So, we I also refer to the uh, idea that if you compare it to the great romantic poets, Blake and Col uh, sorry, Wordsworth and Coleridge. So, uh, it their nature, this nature naturalism is completely opposite to their notion of and this is red in tooth and claw, nature that rips people apart. Okay. Nature is no safe haven for people to hide okay. and interestingly both came one year after another. Now, uh, so this is about nature, what about plots, what kinds of plots do you find in naturalism? You have done American tragedy, what kind of a plot is that? Give me that one word that Emil Zola give you, has given you. Emil Zola, we have been talking about Emil Zola who is the father of naturalism, the bath human. Okay? So, this is the human beast. Okay? Now, how what could be a, a human beast? It is not a werewolf that Michael Jackson turning into werewolf in thriller, okay? something else, the beast within 
the animal within and what was the so we were talking about design under the M's which is a naturalist play we uh, were also trying to draw some comparisons between another naturalistic work that we have done recently an American tragedy by Dreiser and interestingly both plays both works were published in quick succession of each other one in 1924 and Dreiser's work in 1925 both of them deal with the concept of American dream which is characterized by unbridled passion, ambition and desires. Okay, we are also talking about nature which in all works of natural all naturalistic plays is raw, earthly, hostile, unkind, indifferent. You can add on all these adjectives unkind and indifferent. Okay, and then you have a plot where what kind of a plot was American tragedy? Remember, did I talk about Darwin? Yeah, yeah. yeah. what did Darwin talk about? Survival, Survival of the fittest. survival of the fittest la beth human. So, the human beast has to struggle and kill its own kind in order to survive that is the idea. Characters, now what are characters driven by? Greed, passion, ambition, betrayal, what kinds of what kinds of uh, um, social setup they come from? We saw both kinds, but generally it is about the working class. Okay? So, the working class. Okay? Characters are generally low lives, uneducated. Okay? That is how Dreiser. Huh? Immoral characters, good. Immoral characters. So, this is the backdrop. Okay, go through these points again because we finished American tragedy just fortnight ago and you have forgotten most of it. Now, um, O'Neill was a play a playwright who wrote in the beginning of the 20th century. Okay. Along with Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams, he is one of the three major dram American dramatists of the 20th century. Okay. So, what was a view from the bridge all about? What kind? Do you remember anything? If I asked you to, okay, but not strictly speaking naturalists, because other characters are quite noble and we also discussed Eddie Carbon as an ideal tragic hero. Okay. Now, tell me that uh, um, it is about the working class people, but I am interested in something else now. Um, when we were talking about the character of the lawyer El Fieri, who is the narrator? Okay, what, what other themes that I brought in? Chorus. Okay. Chorus is, uh, yeah. So, uh, a choric character okay. and therefore, when we are talking about a choric character, the broader form of drama we are talking about the Greek, the Greek play. Now, what are the, uh, if you can, if you can go back to whatever you did in Oedipus what is the general construction of a Greek play? Okay. okay. So, you remember the Frey text triangle, okay. rising action, exposition, you have rising action, you have a climax, you have falling action and you have a denouement.
and you have a choric character. When we talked about uh, the concept of um, a Greek act uh, or a Greek play and when we were talking about a view uh, from the bridge and then also compared it to Oedipus and other Greek plays. Okay, did we come across, what is the central thread, what, what is Eddie Carbon driven by, what is his tragedy? No, no, give me one word, what is his jealousy for or what is his passion for? Lust, okay, lust, just lust, okay, Incestuous. for who? Incest, okay. So, incest is also one of the uh, themes that was very often dealt with by the great Greek playwrights and which was also used by the, the great American playwrights who wanted to write the so called Greek plays. Okay. And why are we calling it the so called Greek plays? They, because they, these were Greek in not origin, it is not like an adaptation, the construction, okay. the kinds of characters, okay. employment of choric characters, okay. then idea of incest and then take the Greek construction and situate it in American con, uh, context and then at the same time get influenced by um, the then new theories of naturalism and ha talk about the idea of the low lives, the la labeth human. Okay. So, combining the Greek structure with naturalism. So, this is what the play this is how you have to approach the play, combining the Greek plot structure, choric character and then naturalistic ideas which were the, at the beginning of the 20th century. So, Emile Zola and Lobeth Human, all these theories started in the early part of the 20th century. So, you have to look you know, immediately after the decadent period or aesthetic period. So, after that we had these people, you know at begin, end of realism, beginning of naturalism. Okay. So, we have to contextualize the play in against that framework. All right. So, now um, in a Greek play, how many characters do you find? I mean, uh, in the sense that how who are the people? You have done morning becomes Electra. Okay. So, who are the people generally found in a Greek play? Characters. Okay. A person who reveals the truth. Uh, okay. Uh, generally, Greek plays are also characterized. We are talking about incest, but then uh, you know the idea of patricide, parricide, regicide. Okay. What what are those? Killing of father. Okay. And or rebelling at least against your father. So, Oedipus kills his father, right. So, all those themes are also implicit in the play, ok. Now, um, there is another play from which uh, Greek play that this play derives from and that I will uh, approach later. First, you get all these the basics clear. So, we go on to the characters now. Now, what is yeah, we are talking about I have been talking about nat nature a lot raw, earthly, hostile, unkind and then we you also gave me a term called pathetic fallacy, when nature assumes human attributes. Okay. Now, what is what is the uh, meaning of elms? Yeah, it is a kind of a tree, what does it look like? Tall. Okay, so, elms are those tallish trees, okay, very tall thin and then they droop at the top okay. and then look at the way the opening description is done. Please look at the text, okay. there is no scope for much digression and diversion, okay. so it is not morbidic now. Okay. So, you have to get out of that frame of mind and here you will find that you will have minimal characters which is again a part of an attribute of the classic Greek plays. Okay, minimal characters, how many characters do you remember from Oedipus? The king, his queen and then there is 
Yeah, Creon. Okay, King Creon, who is? Yocasta's brother. brother. And then? Cory character, then Tarsius, the blind prophet. Apart from that, perhaps you, you may know the messenger who comes here and there and there. Yeah, the shepherd, the messenger. Okay. Now, you look at this play. Ephraim Cabot, these are your characters. Ephraim Cabot, and then he is the patriarch. So, Greek plays you remember are heavily patriarchal in nature. So, this yeah, so this is about patriarchy. And then how this woman comes along and tries to subvert. Now, and then you have three sons, Simon, Peter, and Eben, and you can well imagine, you can already anticipate what happens when there is a father and then he has three sons. So, Simon, Peter, and Eben, and then you have Abby Putnam. Abby Putnam is the heroine here. And then you have very few characters, a young girl, two farmers, the fiddlers, a sheriff and other folk from the neighboring farms. The action of the uh, entire play takes place and immediately outside of the Cabot farmhouse in New England in the year 1850. Now, wh what is the setting 1850 and it is uh, a little before the civil war, American civil war and it is also the peak period of the gold rush, the Californian gold rush. Are you aware of that? Period. What happened? Yes. Gold was discovered. <laughs> okay, so people wanted to migrate to California. Okay, and to those regions, nearing regions. Okay, that is the idea. All right. Now, um, uh, look at the stage directions. Uh, the south end of the house faces front to a stone wall with a wooden gate, and keep on. Uh, referring or marking all the things that denote nature. So, nature is a stone wall. You can tell me what kinds of people would live in this house. What is the? It is a very melodramatic kind of a place. Everything is up there. All the emotions are larger than life. <coughs> With a wooden gate at center opening on a country road. The house is in a good condition, but in need of paint. Its walls are a sickly greyish. The green of the shutters faded. Two enormous elms are on each side of the house. They bend their trailing branches down over the roof. They appear to protect and at the same time subdue. Now, aren't we getting lot of human attributes? Yeah, yeah. Because they, how can trees? How can elms? subdue and protect, okay, but it is the nature of the, yeah, is the, is the nature, is the kind of nature. So, that is the nature and then look at the house, sickly grayish wall. So, definitely so far you would not come across anything that is positive, uh, yeah. So, a positive image is not presented at all about it. They bend their trailing branch, branches down over the roof, they appear to protect and at the same time subdue. There is a sinister maternity in their aspect, a crushing jealous absorption. What is a sinister maternity? What is maternity? Uh, well, oxymoronic because you feel that maternity, <laughs> yeah, ma <laughs> that maternal feelings can never be sinister, but then in the context of uh, this play, they can be. Okay, so, what is sinister maternity then? Maternity then, what is it? Why sinister? Sinister is devious, devilish okay? and therefore, that this is the kind of influence the mother has, okay? uh, devilish presence. Okay? See all Freud gave us his ideas of theory of Oedipus complex. Okay. They all emanate from these ideas, sinister and destructive uh, aspect of maternity. So, mother motherhood is uh, um, generally idealized in most cultures, but uh, then according to some psychoanalysts, motherhood is after all, you know, it can stunt, it can crush. 
okay, which is also true and which is have, you know, because they never let go of their children, that is the idea. So, they crush their children because of the sinister love, love can also be crushing, so love can have negativity also. They have developed from their own, uh, from their intimate contact with the life of man in the house an appalling humanness. So, there is humanness, but it is, they are human like, but that human, it is not very positive uh, humanity, appalling humanity. Okay, the man in the house, the father of the house, who is the father of the house? Ephraim. Yeah. They brood oppressively over the house. So, again, M's are presented as humans. Okay, so, they brood over the house. They are like exhausted women resting their sagging breasts and hands and hair on its roof and when it rains their tears trickle down monotonously and rot on the shingles. Now, what kind of imagery is presented? Yeah, I mean, who's tired? Female form. Yeah, sagging breasts. She's sad. She's tired, and she's exhausted. The man of the house has crushed her, and she, in turn, wants to crush him. Okay, so that's the imagery that is presented to us. Okay, so exhausted. <laughs> so it is. It cannot. It's a very dysfunctional family, if perhaps, or picture. In if you apply the modern term, in O'Neill's times, perhaps people didn't didn't use such terms, dysfunctional family. Okay, but nowadays we use it, it is a fashionable term. So, if we apply this term here, yeah, it is a dysfunctional family. And their tears now, whose tears? Elm's te M's tears. They, yeah, tear, yeah. So, again, attributing human attribute uh, qualities to nature. There is a path running from the gate around the right corner of the house to the front door. A narrow porch is on this side. The end wall facing us has two windows in its upper story, two larger ones in the floor below. So, this is the stage direction, this is the kind of the house that you are going to have. Deep colors, the green of the elms glows, but the house is in shadow, seeming pale and washed out by contrast. A, do a door opens and even cabin comes to the end of the porch and stands looking down the road to the right. He has a large bell in his hand and this he swings mechanically, awakening a definite <coughs> anger. Then he puts his hands on his hips and stares up at the sky. He sighs with a puzzled awe and blurts out with halting appreciation. Okay, now wait. Uh, look at the nature again. Sunset of a day at the beginning of summer in the year this so and so, they know wind and everything still. The sky above the roof is suffused with deep colors, the green of the elm glows and the house is in shadow seeming pale and washed out by contrast. Now, Gayatri you are interested in colors, can you comment on these lines? Suffused with deep colors. Now, uh, O'Neill is not going to give you terms like saturated coloration, okay, because O'Neill does not belong to that, you know, he would not be having that kind of lexicon. But then, uh, is not he talking about saturated colors, okay, deep, suffused with deep. What, what does it? So, is not it, uh, if you extend the term, then do not you think that the stage directions is extremely expressionistic? Yes. So, this is how, so you now this is how you have to extrapolate. So, no, O'Neill is not going to sit here and tell you, look I am doing saturation colors and it is an expressionistic, yeah. So, you have to read between the lines and look at the stage directions that what the writer is trying to tell you here, okay. So, expressionism if you remember we are talking about a play published in 1924, expressionist art was something at the peak of that period okay and theater and cinema yes was responding to it okay very positively so therefore i'm very sure that uh, o'neill also and other plays by o'neill are also extremely expressionistic in nature okay for example the uh, emperor jones and um, and uh, this also foreshadows the tension happening between the two characters 
between these brothers also right yeah. true true that, that's what we are going to see now a door opens and aben kebet uh, comes to the door end of the porch and stands looking down the road to the right he wa he has a large bell and this uh, he swings mechanically awakening a deafening uh, clangor then he puts his hands on his hips and stares up at the sky and sighs with a puzzled awe and blurts out with a halting appreciation god pretty now there is no such word as pretty you have to look at the rural new england dialect okay so every uh, play comes with a particular dialect okay so perhaps if you remember uh, a view from the bridge had uh, the so called brooklyn italian dialect remember many a time i would tell you that look this is the kind of a very specific to this kind of italian american working class okay now here it is the rural new england okay so dialect so pretty is for pretty okay and why he looks at the sky so this is something that every character will do repeatedly in the play looking at the sky and muttering something so nature reflecting the mood of the characters anu carry on his eyes his eyes fall and he stares about him frowningly he is 25 tall and sinewy his face is well formed good looking but the expression is resentful and defensive his defiant dark eyes remind one of a wild animals in captivity each day is a cage in which he finds himself trapped but inwardly unsubdued there is a fierce repressed vitality about him he has black hair mustache a thin curly trace of beard he is dressed in rough farm clothes he spits on the ground with intense disgust turns and goes back into the house simeon and peter come in from their work in the fields they are tall men much older than their half brother simeon is 39 and peter 37 built on a squarer simpler model fleshier in body more bovine and homelier in face shrewder and more practical their shoulders stoop a bit from years of farm work they clump heavily along in their clumsy thick soled boots caked with earth their clothes their faces hands bare arms and throats are earth stained they smell of earth they stand together for a moment in front of the house and as if with one impulse stare dumbly up at the sky leaning on their hoes their faces have a compressed undesigned expre expression as they look upwards this softens so simon says pretty okay so same expression same motif repeated again and again now who would like to comment on this is there anything that is uh, left unsaid here whatever you want to know about a character don't you feel that o'neil has given up given away everything about a character so is there anything that you are reading between lines here okay what kind so there are two brothers here simon and peter they are born of one mother and the third the young the younger brother eben is born of another mother and both mothers are dead so therefore two elms okay now come connect this to two the two elms and the sinister maternity okay the exhausted women the tears trickling down so what kind of a presence is there so you won't find actually it's not a, a horror movie or a horror show here okay so you won't find ghosts coming out of nowhere but okay yeah sadness associated but also the haunting, haunting yeah presence. so that it's a, it's like a haunting presence the mothers maybe they have suffered and they have died okay and then perhaps the two elms they symbolize the dead mothers so ma the 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 elms act as a metaphor for those exhausted long suffering tortured women who were just a uh, slog to work because it's a hard kind of a farm now remember it's not a city space that you are talking about it's not a, it's a rich man's farm okay but uh, even on a rich man if it's a miserly stingy kind uh, stingy side sort of a rich man then he will make his wife's work okay and they died of exhaustion and overwork that's the idea 
ok. And then there are two sons who are like what? How different are these two from Eben? Ok. Now, see in uh, Eben there is a repressed and fierce vitality ok. So, that is his masculinity being talked about. Whereas, these two men uh, Simon and Peter they are tall and uh, built on a squarer simpler model ok almost like a car fleshier in body more bovine and homelier. What is bovine? Cow like and what is cow like men? More domesticated kind of men ok. Whereas, Evan is not he is a different kind of a man ok and homelier also. 18 years ago what? Jen my woman she died. I forgot. I recollect now and again makes it lonesome. She hair longs of horsetail and yellow like gold. Wall she's gone. No it's like well. Oh, well she's gone. There's gold in West Sim. In the sky. Well in a manner of speaking that's the promise. Gold in the sky in the West Golden Gate. California gold is West fields ago. Fortune's lane just the top of the ground waiting to be picked. Solomon's mines. Solomon's mines, they says. For a moment, they continue looking up at the sky. Then their eyes drop. Here, it stones are top of the ground. Stones are top of stones, making the stone walls. Here, atop here, him and you and me and then Evan, making stone walls for him to fence our skin. We work. Give our strength, give our years, plowed him under the ground. Rotten, making soil for his crops. Well, the Farm pays good for your words. If we plow in California, there would be lump of gold in the fire. California's <coughs> the other side of earth the most. We got to calculate. It would be hard for me to <coughs> give up what we earned here by our sweat. I maybe he'll die soon. Maybe. Maybe for all we know he's dead now. He has proof. He's been <coughs> gone two months with no proof. <coughs> Left us in the field in the evening like this. Hitched up and drove off into the west. That's plum unnatural. Unnatural. He Hain never been off this farm except in the village in thirty year, year or more, not since he married Evans mom. I calculate we might get him declared crazy by the court. He's kindled too slick. He got the best of all of them. They never believed him crazy. We got to wait till he's underground. Honor their father. Yes. Okay. Um, Sona, do you have the text? Yeah. Read for Eben. Honor thy father. I pray he is dead. Supper's ready. I. Sun's drowning pretty. I. There's gold on the west. I. Yonder atop on the hill pasture, ye may. In California. California. Well, supper is getting cold. I are hungry. I am hungry. I are hungry. I smell bacon. Bacon's good. Bacon's bacon. They turn, shouldering each other, their bodies bumping and rubbing together as they hurry clumsily to their food like two friendly oxen. So, look at the animal imagery. First, they are con uh, compared with bovine. bovine. Yeah, and now it's ox. And what do these animals do? They just work. They just work to death. Okay, you make an ox. Ox is not a dangerous animal. It can't do anything. Even referring to their father, how their father just keeps makes them work all the time. Oh yeah, and how he kept them uh, mothers working all the time, he skinned them, okay, to death. So that's the kind of family they come from. They are used to hard work. They are and look at uh, the other imagery also. Peter says. Stones atop the ground, stones atop stones, making stone walls. Do not you think there is poetry even in this rustic dialect? It is almost like Wordsworth's poem. Okay. So, a, there is a poem called Michael of by Wordsworth, okay, if you are not familiar with Michael. So, it is a very beautiful uh, 
Michael is an old farmer, he works and works and works and then he dies, but then nature there is very yeah, friendly, okay, a very compassionate, <coughs> yeah. but here so much of a stone here imagery, okay. so it is like hardened people, they do not care for each other, what do they think of? Gold in California and when will this old man die, so that we can inherit his farm, okay. because who is not like and we do not sympathize with the father also, because we, I, we, as we have already been told, he has worked the mothers to death and he has been working these two, three sons also to death. So, again we go back to the naturalist characters. Okay, and what are the naturally the labeth human, okay, the hum, animal like and whoever survives. So, mothers were not up to it, okay, so they could not survive, but these two sons survived and the third one is also trying to cope with the harshness of his father. But then all this is another characteristic of uh, naturalist uh, uh, text unsympathetic characters, very objectively drawn, not sympathetically, not subjectively, but it is only he is trying to present a kind of characters and these are the working class people okay, and this is how they are going to be. You will not find any finer sensibilities in them, because where will it come from that is the idea. Scene 2. The colour fades from the sky, twilight begins. The interior of the kitchen is now visible. A pine table is at centre, a cook stove in the right rear corner, four rough wooden chairs, a tallow candle on the table. In the middle of the rear wall is fastened a big advertising poster with the ship in full sail and the word California in big letters. Kitchen utensils hang from nails, everything is neat and in order, but the atmosphere is of a men's camp kitchen rather than that of a home. Places for three are laid. Eben takes boiled potatoes and bacon from the stove and puts them on the table, also a loaf of bread and a crock of water. Simeon and Peter shoulder in, slum down uh, in their chairs without a word. Eben joins them. The three eat in silence for a moment, the two elder as naturally unrestrained as bees of the field. Even picking at his food without appetite, glancing at them with a tolerant dislike. Okay, so this is the third time that uh, O'Neill is referring to them as animals. So uh, bees of burden, okay, bees of the field, and then uh, you have so. Okay, so now if you just visualize the entire setup, um, so this is the interior of and then a kitchen, the dining table is placed in the kitchen, like most American homes and you have all the kitchen utensils hanging around, okay. but what is so important, what is so significant about this setup is, in the middle of the rear wall is fastened a big advertising poster okay, with a ship in full sail and the word California. So, what is the idea here? Going to California, California is that American dream, okay, that American paradise that they all. So, this Farmhouse is something they want to escape and California symbolizes the American dream, the desires, the ambitions. So, uh, all these men have desires of their own. Okay, so, the, the brothers desire to go to California someday, the father desires to keep the sons home, so that he can make them work to death, okay, but, he, he, but he is not going to let them inherit anything till he dies. Okay, so, he is going to stay, so this is a kind of conflict, so therefore, it is necessary that this kind of father dies, that is what uh, O'Neill is telling us. Looky here, you he would oughtn't to say that even, Don't righteous, what? He prayed he died, well do not you pray it, he is a poor, not mine, he would not let no one else say that about your ma, ha. I meant I hadn't. I hate. I hate. I ain't his. Ain't like him. He hate me. Wait till you've grown his age. <coughs> I am a uh, ma. Every drop of blood. Blood. Okay, you understand the context here. I am not like pa at all. You, uh, therefore, he even disowns him completely. I am not his. Okay, so they these two they have their low life kind of humor and they say okay, don't say that 
otherwise you will be abusing your mother you're saying something derogatory about your mother that this is not your father but then he says what i mean is i am not at all like him uh, every blood drop of my blood is my ma ma so again look at the we were talking about mothers haunt the play okay not for the older brothers but for eben he is completely obsessed completely and the more you read the more we get into the play you will realize that how much he is possessed by the presence of his dead mother also in the description before uh, it says how it's a camp kitchen and not a home yeah like, like a woman makes a yeah. kitchen it's a home and hot field yes <laughs> yeah so it's all a stone yeah and dry okay and once in a while they look at the sky where there is an a warm glow of orange and they call it pretty otherwise it's a dark colorless grayish hard like way of life for them yes she was good to sell and me a good step mascot she was good to everyone ever uh, great in mood gets to his feet and makes an awkward bow to each of them stammering i would be thankful to you i am her heir ha- i am her heir i am i inherit her she is good to him Oh, oh. And for that, thanks, he killed her. No one ever kills nobody. It's always something. It's That's always the, something. That's the murder. Did he slave Ma to death? He slaved himself to death. He slaved Sumini and me to death. Only none of us ain't died yet. It's something driving him to drive us. Well, hold him to judgment. Something. What? What? Something. I don't know. What's driving you to California? Maybe. Oh, I have heard. I have heard you, but you will never go to the gold fields. Maybe. What? Uh, what will you get the money? We can walk. It's not all my three ways. California. But if you were to pull all the steps, we'd walk out in this farm end, and we'd be in the moon. The Indians inj- will scalp you on the plains. You know the Indians. That's for Indians. So. Indians will scalp you on the way. You know, you'll be. This is a time when Indians were an extremely hostile presence. Okay, so we are talking about the late uh, 19th century. So this is the those were the we are the middle 19 mid 19th century. So this is the period and where the war between the settlers and the Indians was at its peak, and uh, Indians would scalp. people you know take away the scalp this, is, this was their way of proclaiming victory yes we may be make and pay your hair for a hair but that in that you won't never go because you will wait here for your share of the farm thinking always, always he'll die soon we were right two thirds belong to us you have no right she was in your ma it was her farm didn't he didn't he steal it from her she's dead it's my farm Tell that to Pa when he comes. I'll bet he a dollar he'll laugh for once in his life. Ha, ha. What if you got held against us even? Your year after year, it's cult in your eye. Something. I, I. Uh, there is something. Why didn't you never stand between him and my Ma when he was slaving her to her great grave? Great pay her back for the kindness she has she she done to you. Well, well, this stock got to be watered. There was wooding to do, and plowing, and haying, and spreading manure, and weeding, and pruning, and milking. And okay, so again, observe the poetic cadence of this year. So, they they may be uh, rustics, but they still have poetry in them. Okay, so what were you doing? when my mother was suffering so with there was so much of work we just couldn't pay attention to very domestic people, very domestic people. yes <coughs> and making walls stone a top a stone making walls till your hearts a stone you left you have to out on the way of growth on onto a stone wall to wall in your heart <coughs> okay so again the same imagery hardness harshness stony yeah so this is what you are You were fifteen or four years old, and big for your age. Why didn't you ever do nothing? There was chores to do. Chores, chores to sorry, chores to do wasn't there. 
it was only after she died i come to think of it me cooking doing her work that work that made me know her suffer her suffering she come back to help come back to boil potatoes come back to fry bacon come back to bake biscuits come back all crammed up okay we stop here and the idea is that my mother is still not free even in her grave she has been she has suffered so much this man has made her suffer so much and therefore the idea of crushing maternity so it's not like mothers will actually come from the dead but it's the specter that looms large in the background okay so we'll continue it uh, with the same uh, play tomorrow